Okay, welcome everyone. Let's talk a little bit about raw water regulation. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, a couple things to begin with. You're going to see a uh, an ad or a banner at the bottom of most of these slides. I apologize for that. I'm trying to get an, a, a registered version of this software and um, I'm having difficulty with the installation. In any case, I'll get rid of it when it pops up, but it's going to pop up. The other thing is this lecture can become overwhelming very quickly. You may already be overwhelmed. In any case, I'm going to post the actual PowerPoint slides online as well so that you can have them and you can refer to them. Your book's always a good source, but the internet, another great source. So if you have problems with some of these concepts at first, um, please feel free to do some further research. You do not need to know all of this stuff forwards and backwards. I want to present you the basic concepts. I think it's important for you to understand how water moves inside the body and what regulates um, whether we keep water or we get rid of water in the body, you'll see there are a lot of different mechanisms. And it's kind of important because you'll see people on medications or you'll give medications to actually target and either promote or inhibit water movement in certain cases. I'm not going to talk about how water moves across certain cell membranes uh, very specifically here. For example, um, I'm not going to talk about uh, uh, capillary permeability in this lecture very much. We'll talk about it when we get to allergic reactions and histamine and all that other mess. Uh, so for now, we're just going to look at the basics of this. I don't want you to get overwhelmed. There may be a lot of new concepts in here, especially for those of you who have not taken anatomy and physiology yet. In any case, no worries. Bring questions to class as always, and, uh, and we'll get through this. All right, so this is the water regulation lecture. Let's start out by saying uh, it's important for you to know where water is supposed to be. So if you look at this, all right, look at this chart, you'll see that um, that w about um, that the majority of it, right, about 25 liters out of the 40 liters um, is intracellular fluid. So most of the fluid that we have in our body is actually contain contained within cells. And then we have some that's contained in the interstitial fluid. Remember, that's the third space. And then... Um, in other words, this is the extracellular fluid. And then uh, plasma volume, this is the amount that's uh, found inside of, of our blood. So remember, this is the plasma. This is the piece of, of uh, the fluid that's not found within red blood cells. So this is the fluid not including red blood cells. All right, so if you look at that, like 50% of us, uh, of the intravascular space is blood, uh, is red blood cells, comprised of red blood cells. That's the other three liters. We'll talk more about composition of blood and stuff, but I want you to appreciate this is just the water component of things. All right, so in order for us to understand how fluids and how other things actually move within the body, we got to look at a couple of uh, different concepts. The first one is going to be diffusion, simple diffusion. So diffusion is this process where if you have a lot of molecules of a certain type on one side and you have a cell membrane, uh, it's got to be a permeable membrane, something that allows this molecule to traverse or to go through it. This is a channel that's embedded in there. Um, that these molecules will move down their concentration gradient. And we've certainly talked about concentration gradients before. But remember that if we have 100 pieces of whatever, right, and X is whatever, and then we have this cell membrane that's permeable to this, and we have 20 pieces of X on the other side, these guys are going to want to move in this direction. So that's exactly what this is showing you. This is just saying that diffusion takes this molecule. It's going to allow it to go into the cell in this particular case. And the reason for that is because if there are more of these molecules on this side than there are on this side, they're going to move down their concentration gradient towards the lower number of molecules. And this is called diffusion. Diffusion can go the other way as well. It's not a direction specific. It's just to say that if there's a greater concentration in one place than the other, it will always move down that concentration gradient. All right, that's it for diffusion. Now, facilitated diffusion is a little bit different. It's the same concept. We got a lot of these molecules in here, few of these molecules inside the cell. But unfortunately, this molecule is not fat soluble. And fat-soluble molecules are the only ones that can actually go through the cell membrane. And we'll talk more about that, but essentially it's because of these little tails that you see. These little tails are actually, um, they're long strains or strings of fat, if you will. 
Um, so the, the molecule, in order for it to diffuse easily across, it has to be a lipid soluble or a fat soluble substance. So let's just take this particular molecule, and this molecule is glucose, these guys right here, and glucose can't simply just go through the cell uh, membrane and enter into the cell for it to be utilized. It actually needs some assistance to do that, and the assistance that it gets is through this molecule called insulin. So when a molecule requires an assistant or a facilitator to cross through the cell membrane into the cell itself, that's called facilitated diffusion. There's no energy used here. This is diffusion in its simplest form with the little adaptation of requiring a facilitator or some other sort of molecule to help it get into the cell. All right, so let's take a look at, um, at osmosis for a second. I want to just mention uh, a few things about osmosis just very quickly. So osmosis is the diffusion of water. Osmosis means that we are diffusing water and not the molecule. So let's take a look at what that means exactly. So let's take a flask or a beaker. And this beaker is going to be, uh, it's going to be divided in two. There's going to be this division that exists between this beaker. All right? And there's going to be some water in this beaker. And in this beaker, on uh, one side of the beaker, there's going to be a lot of stuff. And it doesn't matter what it is. It's just that there are a ton of molecules over here. All right? There are a ton of molecules and um, compared to the other side. So on this side, there are just a few molecules. So I'm going to represent water in green. All right? So there are water molecules. And all these water molecules are in this guy here. And of course, the number of molecules that I'm drawing is just it's just to graphically represent what I'm trying to show, but it has nothing to do with actual numbers. All right, so if you look at this here, now we're going to take a look at what all this mess means. I'm drawing all these little water molecules in here, and we're going to look at side A and side B. And I want you to see what's going to happen here. So as we said before, um, the blue guys, right? these guys are molecules, and the little green guys are water. And if you look at this, what we're going to do now is we're going to look at this membrane that is non-permeable, meaning that it does not allow these molecules to go through. So the molecules are either too big to go through, they're whatever, but they simply cannot. They get here, and then they cannot go through. So we're going to call this a non-permeable membrane. So the only thing that can cross here, only thing that can cross is water. So you look at this, and it's water that can cross this. The actual molecules themselves cannot cross. So we've, we've got two concentration gradients here, right? If you look at A and B, if you look at the concentration gradients, the concentration gradient of, of the molecules is greater in A than it is in B. And that makes sense because we, here we have like 30 of them. Here we have three of them. Now when we look at water, however, Right? The concentration of water molecules is actually greater in B than it is whoops, than it is in A. So we have two concentration gradients here. One of them relates to the molecules. The other one relates to water. So let's take a look at what wants to happen. The molecules want to go from A to B. And they're trying really hard to do that to try to equalize the number of molecules that exist on both sides. But they can't because there's this membrane here which is non-permeable. It's non-penetrable. So these molecules cannot move. They're stuck. So they stay there and they stay in A. Water, however, is able to actually move across this membrane because it's really tiny. So actually what's going to happen here is water is going to start to equalize here. So it's going to start moving into here until there's an equal number. So let's say there are 100 uh, pieces of water. Let's say there are 97 of them in B and there are three of them in A. Well, approximately 47 of them are going to move over here such that we have an equal number of 50 in both A and B. When this occurs, when this concept occurs, when the movement of water occurs based on molecules and based on a non-permeable membrane, we call that process osmosis. So the osmosis 
is the movement of water, it's the diffusion of water, down a concentration gradient, that's this concept here, and it's going to move from B to A. All right, so pretty simple concept. All right, so let's see how this applies to real world stuff. So let's take a red blood cell, and let's say that this red blood cell, we are going to drop this red blood cell into a bath of water that has exactly the same number of molecules. So we're going to say that it is isotonic. So iso means same, tonic means number of molecules. So if we had 100 molecules inside these red blood cells, the water that we put this red blood cell in also had 100 molecules in it. So the cell and the surrounding water, there's no movement, or if the movement does occur, it's equal. All right, so we have 100 molecules, 100 molecules, and they stay that way. So let's say the three molecules might go in, then three molecules might come out. But in any case, it's equal for the most part. All right, now what's going to happen is we are going to take a solution, and we're going to drop the same red blood cell. We're going to now put it in a solution where there are more molecules in the solution than there are in the red blood cell. So here we might have, we might have 500 molecules, and inside the red blood cell we only had 100. So what's trying to happen is we have this flask again, and it's split down the middle. And on this side we have 100 molecules, this side we have 500 molecules. This is a non-permeable membrane. So ideally what would happen is these molecules would want to come over here and they would want to equalize, but they can't. There's no equalization that can take place here. So this is the red blood cell, and this is the extracellular fluid. This is actually the, the plasma that exists here in the blood. And when we have more molecules in the plasma than we do inside the red blood cell, two things are going to try to happen. What we're, first thing is 500 are going to try to equalize. They can't do that. So now what's going to happen is we have osmosis. That means that we actually have more water inside the red blood cell than we do outside the red blood cell. And as a result, water is going to diffuse. We're going to get osmosis out of the red blood cell into the surrounding area. And that's going to cause this little red blood cell to shrink. So when they shrink, this is called crenation. Crenation with an N, not cremation like like burning a body up, but Cree Nation with an N. All right, and as you can imagine, uh, the last possibility here is we're going to take that same red blood cell now, and we're going to take a flask, and we're going to put semipermeable membrane, which is actually the, the cell membrane of the red blood cell. Red blood cells over here, our, um, our plasma or our water or whatever it is is over here, and in this case, we're going to have more molecules inside the cell than we do outside the cell. So here we have 500, here we have 100. So in other words, this is molecules, but if we look at how much water we have, we actually have, uh, we have more water here. We, let's say we have like, like 250 waters here and we have 100 waters here. So water is going to move from this space through osmosis into the red blood cell, and this is called hemolysis eventually this is called hemolysis. So you can see this little red blood cell, it's shrunk down. Now we put it into a hypotonic solution. Hypo meaning less than, less molecules than the surrounding. And when we put it in a hypotonic solution, water invades this cell, it goes into the cell, and it makes it really fat like this. Eventually, if this bursts, if this bursts, then we get something called lysis. And if you think about Lysol, this is cell death, it explodes. Lysis, to lyse something, means to kill it or to make it explode. So we get hemolysis, hemolysis, if we're talking about red blood cell. Hemolysis, that's not hemolyzed yet, but if it gets any bigger and it bursts, now we have hemolysis. All right, so that's osmosis. I think we've killed that uh, enough there, no pun intended. All right, last way we move things is by way of active transport. Anytime you see active this means we're using energy, all right? So energy in the form of adenosine triphosphate, ATP, this is using energy. So when would we need to use energy? We need to use energy when we go against a, con a concentration gradient. So this is representative of the sodium, potassium, ATPase pump. 
and the sodium potassium pump is designed to put potassium back in the cell where it belongs to kick sodium out of the cell and replace it outside the cell where it belongs and unfortunately it doesn't want to do that because it has to go against the concentration gradient so let's take a look at an example so an example is this let's say you have a cell and inside the cell you have two sodiums and outside the cell you have two sodiums well it's not supposed to be like that we're supposed to actually have more sodium outside of the cell than we are inside the cell so this is what has to happen we have to somehow move these two outside but why would this sodium ever want to go outside the cell because it's equal right now so we already said earlier that this is an unnatural this is zero sodium four sodium now we have a concentration gradient and that's not a natural phenomenon meaning that the world is not happy when it's in this situation it wants to equalize it always wants to equalize so in order for us to take these two sodiums and force them out of the cell we have to put energy into the system we put ATP into the system and in, in specifically in this particular mechanism we're looking at sodium potassium pump so this pump is going to take ATP as its energy currency it's going to take sodium it's going to force sodium extracellularly put it back out it's going to take potassium it's going to push potassium back inside the cell and it does this through a mechanism called active transport which is an ATP or energy requiring um, system all right so you can certainly study this on your own I'm not going to go over these I just want you to appreciate how we uh, get water in and how we get rid of it and where we actually lose those different things right, I'm not going to read those things to you um, we'll see some of this stuff as well I think we talked uh, enough about that for now all right you can read all through this <clears throat> if you haven't seen it yet uh, take a look at Starling's hypothesis I did another video on that for you to read all right so I'm not going to waste too much time on this lecture this is again just for your own edification the definitions here again you can read that stuff this is a drawing that you saw before this is uh, Starling's hypothesis this is uh, the movement of water in and out and around this area um, so nothing new here hopefully and if you need to review it then please do so this is another concept map this is a graphic representation of edema at the center of all this and all the things that can cause edema and it all has to do with Starling's hypothesis so anytime you move uh, proteins or you increase pressure somewhere um, then we get edema there's one thing I want to draw your attention to that we didn't talk about in that other um, in that other entry and that was uh, generally speaking we have a little bit more of water a little bit more of fluid that leaks out than it does come back in so if you look at this we actually have a net movement outwards so let's just say let's just say we lose two more molecules out then come back in so we have this little bit of fluid excess that's in the third space here and that's okay because we actually have a system designed for that and that system is something that looks like a vein right? and this is a little lymph guy and so this little lymph guy is called a lymph capillary and the lymph capillary is something that is um, that is designed with these little fenestrations these little windows they're like little valves if you will and they open up so these things can open so what happens is when you get an excess of fluid in here any little bit of excess of fluid there's pressure in here and as with anything else when the pressure here exceeds the pressure that's in here let's say the pressure in here is two millimeters of mercury let's say the pressure here is four millimeters of mercury this little valve opens up in the lymph vessel and the fluid goes inside the lymph vessel when these two pressures equalize this door shuts and this lymph goes back to our lymph nodes and then it gets dumped back into the venous system so when we talk about uh, when we talk about edema and and fluid uh, this is something that I want to draw your attention to here is that's one thing that we didn't mention was lymph obstruction so just another cause of edema when we get lymph obstruction then that's also uh, a cause for us to see edema all right so this one I want you to know all right ADH antidiuretic hormone you'll also know it as vasopressin this is actually a drug in ACLS land 
All right, so we'll talk more about vasopressin. Actually, I'm not sure this has any benefit anymore. There's a lot of literature that goes against this. But anyway, your body has antidiuretic hormone, and antidiuretic hormone, ADH, is also known as vasopressin. Important for you to know that it is one of the two things that's in the uh, that's released by the posterior pituitary. The other one is oxytocin or pitocin, same thing. All right, so these are the only two that are stored and, uh, and released by the posterior pituitary. Everything else is in the anterior pituitary, all our other, other hormones there. All right, so vasopressin, posterior pituitary, think about that just for a second. Now, this is kind of an overwhelming chart, so you don't need to know all of this, all right? What I want you to appreciate is that antidiuretic hormone is something that shows up, all right? And antidiuretic hormone causes water to be reabsorbed by the kidneys. If you, at the kidney level, increase the amount of water that you maintain, that means that you're going to increase the amount of blood volume that you have circulating, and as a result, you'll increase blood pressure. So the next few slides are all slides that show the pathways of maintaining blood pressure exactly where it needs to be. So if we, in this particular case, if blood pressure decreases, that stimulates baroreceptors to tell the sympathetic nervous system that it should tell the kidneys to do something. And it does it with this molecule called renin. This is not renin, all right, with two N's. Renin is something else, all right? It's something you find in cheese. It's something, uh, it has to do with lactation. So this is renin. This is renin with a long E. And renin is something that works at the kidneys. Um, so kidneys release renin. Uh, we'll talk about angiotensin in just a minute, but the idea here is that this is a very complex piece, and at the end of it, at the end of it, we get an increased blood pressure as a result of volume. So antidiuretic, diuresis, means to get rid of through urine. If you anti-make urine, if you stop making urine, you increase blood volume, you increase blood pressure. That you should know. That's an important concept for you to have in the, in the back of your mind. All right, so again, another very, con uh, what looks to be a complex slide here, but the goal here is that um, there are a bunch of different ways to do business here. One of the things we can do is the body can constantly monitor the amount of sodium concentration in your blood. And when the sodium concentration is high in your blood, the body says, holy crap, there must not be enough water. So what it does is it tells your hypothalamus that you should be thirsty, it makes you drink, it also tells your hypothalamus to uh, talk to the posterior pituitary to release ADH, and then you know the rest of it from here. ADH causes decrease in urine and a reuptake of water, and as a result, you get an increase in plasma volume. When you get an increase in plasma volume, of course, the final result in this is increase arterial blood pressure. All right, so this is another mechanism that we have. It is water-based regulation to maintain blood pressure, so that's why I want you to know it. All right, now, things get worse, right? But we've already covered some of this stuff. We already talked about this component. That's the last slide. We already talked about blood pressure with respect to venous, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, sympathetic nervous system. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. And now I want to introduce to you this new concept, and that is the pathway of the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. All right, so this sounds like a complicated system, and it is. But ultimately, it targets a few things you already know. And here are the things you already know. If we have these stretch receptors and they stop being stretched because we have a loss of volume or a loss of pressure, when you decrease the stretch in these vessels, it tells the kidneys you better do something about it, and it does something about it by releasing renin. Kidneys release renin. Renin goes into the circulating uh, system. It releases all sorts of things like angiotensinogen, which causes angiotensin 1 to come out from the lungs. Angiotensin 2 shows up. Remember that angio, blood vessel, tensin means pressure. So angio is vessel and tensin, pressure. So this is blood pressure. Whoops. Blood pressure or vessel pressure. That's what these things mean. So angiotensin uh, also triggers a cascade of other events, but ultimately what it does is it increases vessel pressure by decreasing the vessel size. So vasoconstriction leads to an increase in blood pressure. All right, next, 
Angiotensin II does this. It also tells the uh, adrenal cortex to release aldosterone. Aldosterone is known as the sodium saver. So aldosterone saves sodium. As we saw earlier, sodium and water love to hang out with one another. So if you take a semi-permeable membrane and you hold or you increase the amount of sodium that exists on this side, water is going to follow it. So let's take a practical example of that. Here's a blood vessel. Hold sodium, put lots of sodium in here, put lots of sodium in here. Now what's going to happen if there's any water around this blood vessel, it's going to be drawn in. If we draw water into this area, what do we get? We get an increase in blood volume, which means an increase in blood pressure. So renin, angiotensin, aldosterone, complicated system, involves many different pathways. The bottom line here is when we, get a, when we notice that there's been a decline or a decrease in pressure or volume, the kidneys come in, the lungs come in, and aldosterone comes in, and now we have a couple things that happen. We have vasoconstriction that takes place. We have sodium that's reabsorbed. We have water that's reabsorbed, which increases the blood volume, and that results in increased blood pressure. All right, so I don't want you to go home. I don't want you to be at home. I don't want you to look at this and go, holy crap, I can't remember all this stuff. It will come. The more, I, more exposure you get to it, the more it will come. So try not to worry about that. I don't want you to sit and study this stuff like for hours on end. You just look at it every once in a while and you have a general idea of the concepts. That's the goal here. All right, osmoreceptors, I just want you to appreciate that. Actually, um, in order for us to measure how much water there is in the body, we actually don't have a way of directly measuring that. What we do is we measure how much uh, solute exists, so usually sodium. So if sodium's really, really high, these are inversely proportional, that means that water's probably low. If sodium is really, really low, that means that water's probably pretty high. So if, water's, uh, if sodium's really high and water's really low, this triggers the system of maintaining water. So this triggers all of those things that we just saw. Right? If sodium's low, that means you have too much water, this triggers diuresis. Whoops diuresis. So ADH not released, right? We don't want to anti-diurese anybody. So this inhibits all of those things. So this is a stimulatory, this is an inhibitory. So we do that by way of, uh, of, ADA, of, um, of measuring water essentially. All right, we'll talk a lot more about volume and pressure receptors. You can just kind of take a look at those to see where those things are for now. All right, here's another thing you can kind of take a look at your own, uh, at your own time here of, of how, we, how the body is uh, designed to think that they're thirsty. And, uh, and we always say, you know, kind of cliche that by the time your body says to you and you realize that you're thirsty, it's already because this has occurred, it's because this has occurred, it's because this has occurred and this has occurred. So lots of stuff has already occurred by the time you get here. So by the time you're actually feeling thirsty, you're dehydrated already. You're dehydrated already. You should never feel thirsty. If you feel thirsty, it's because you don't have enough water. All right, let's take a look at aldosterone. Very specifically, this was the sodium saver. Remember, this was a sodium saver we just talked about. And aldosterone says, hey, uh, if we have a, a decrease in this concentration of sodium uh, or the renin angiotensin mechanism has been triggered, that tells us that the top of the kidneys there, the cortex, the adrenal cortex should release aldosterone, tells the kidneys that it should increase sodium reabsorption, and as a result, it is going to increase volume. It's, gonna, it's got an antidiuretic effect. All right, I want to introduce this new thing now. This is called atrial natriuretic peptide. So atrial means it comes from the atria in the heart. Natrium, natrium is sodium. Right? If you look at the chemical symbol for sodium, it's this because it's natrium. A uretic effect means that it diureses, it causes you to pee, and a peptide is an amino acid chain. All right, so atrial natriuretic peptide. How the heck does this have anything to do with blood pressure? Well, here's how it works. It's a protective mechanism. If you have too much blood pressure coming back to the atria, you get an increased stretch of atrial tissue. When that happens, ANP is released. 
ANP is released and all these things happen. Look what happens. Renin, you already know about it. If it decreases renin release, that means you get vasodilation. This is exactly opposite of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system we saw. This is the inhibitory mechanism. So we talked about the stimulatory mechanism. Now we're talking about how does it get inhibited. We inhibit renin angiotensin aldosterone system by way of ANP as one mechanism. So too much pressure back to the, uh, to the atria, the right side of the heart. ANP gets released, baroreceptors. Uh, we get a decrease in ADH, so we inhibit ADH release. So we anti-anti-diuretic hormone, which means it doesn't go. All right, that means that we get rid of this increased urine. Right, if we increase the urine production, then we get a decrease in the blood volume, which results in decreased blood pressure. Again, you'll see here ANP directly inhibits aldosterone release, which, of course, affects sodium, which means the kidneys allow more sodium to go out. All right? They don't reabsorb it. They let it go out into the urine. So this and this all goes out, which results in a decrease in blood volume, which is a decrease in blood pressure. All right, cool. So this is a big picture of everything we just saw. All right, this is the whole concept here, the whole kit and caboodle. This is called the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. All right, so renin was this piece. All right, um, we talked about angiotensin, we talked about aldosterone, and these guys work collectively as a system, essentially to increase blood volume and to increase blood pressure. All right, that's all about that one. All right, we're almost done, folks. Uh, last thing here, I just want to show you, this is another uh, direct implication and application of osmosis. All right, so these concepts are going to constantly be repeating themselves. All right, so here's what happens. If we have, um, we're going we're gonna, to uh, increase the amount of, of, uh, of fluid loss here. So we're going to get this fluid. It's going gonna, it's gonna to go out. When you lose fluid outside of the body, things start to happen. That means that the extracellular fluid is going to be losing fluid to the outside. Well, if you lose fluid here, that means that you'll have more molecules here than you do here. So here you'll have 100 molecules. Now you'll have 200 molecules here because you've lost water. So in relation to one another, you're going to lose water. So now what happens is osmosis. So we have all the water that's in here, and that water is going to leak from the intercellular fluid, from the inside the cells, to the extracellular fluid. And we get, you saw this earlier, this is crenation. All right, so we happen to look at it with a red blood cell. In this particular case, we're looking at it with all cells. It's exactly the opposite for this. If you put too much water into the system, if it ends up in the extracellular space, essentially what you end up with is it looks like you have more molecules in here than you do out here when you have too much water here. So water moves in this direction, and it causes lysis of those cells, or it causes edema to appear. All right, so just some different ways that we can apply osmosis to dehydration and hyperhydration in the clinical setting. All right, bring questions to class, study hard, keep up the good work.